Tonight, um, it's our honor and pleasure to have Ken Marcus with us. Ken has spoken at our events in the past, so it's wonderful to have him back. Ken Marcus is the President and General Counsel of the Lewis uh, D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law. As the author of an award-winning Jewish, an award-winning book entitled "Jewish Identities and Civil Rights in the United in, in America," uh, New York, Cambridge University Press, um, Ken founded the Brandeis Center in 2011 to combat the resurgence of anti-Semitism at U.S. universities uh, throughout the country. In November 2012, uh, Ken was named to the forward, the Jewish newspaper, as among the 50 most, most influential uh, American Jews who played a role or has impacted upon the news and the society uh, in 2012. Um, during his public service, uh, Ken served as the staff director at the United States Commission on Civil Rights, and that's where I actually met you for the first time. I'm a younger, more naive guy coming to ask all kinds of questions. Um, and the world has changed since those days. Uh, and it wasn't that long ago, it was probably like seven or nine years ago, I guess. Uh, and he was a delegate, uh, delegated the authority of the Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights and the Assistant Secretary of Housing and Urban Development for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. This was under the Bush administration, the second one. Shortly before his departure from the, Civil Rights, from the Civil Rights Commission, the Wall Street Journal observed that the governance, uh, sorry, the, I'm sorry, the Wall Street Journal observed that the commission has rarely been better, better managed, and that it, was, it deserves a medal for all the good governance that it did under Ken's leadership. For his work in government, uh, Ken was named the first recipient of the Justice and Ethics Award for outstanding work in the field of civil rights. Ken Marcus also served, uh, serves as associate editor of the journal for the study of anti-Semitism and is the vice president of the International Association for the Study of Anti-Semitism. A vibrant organization. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So Ken was a, a founding member of that organization, which I'm also involved. Ken. Um, <coughs> Previously held the Lilly and Nathan Ackerman Chair in Equality and Justice in American in, in America at, the, at City University in New York, at the Bernard Baruch College for School of Public Affairs, he, and was the chair of the Scholars for Peace in the Middle East Legal Task Force. Before entering public service, Ken Marcus was a litigator, a litigation partner in two major law firms, where he conducted complex commercial and constitutional litigation. He publishes frequently in academic journals, as well as in more popular venues such as Commentary, The Weekly Standard, The Christian Science Monitor, and others. Ken Marcus is a graduate of Willem College, uh, Magna Cum Laude, and the University of California at Berkeley's Law School. So, it's a pleasure to have him here, and we're having these pamphlets. The uh, Louis D. Brandeis Center is a new center, as I just said, it's about two years old. And I think it's, it's doing really important work, very important work. It's a cutting edge of an emerging issue. And uh, Ken's at the forefront of it, so it's really not in the rear. Thank you, Charles. Thank you all. Uh, I, I love it when Charles says he's involved in an organization. In fact, he was the founding president of it, so that's a, a admirable humility. Uh, good to see you all. Um, I feel that the, uh, the first time I spoke to uh, Charles's organization was essentially the first half of, of the story. Uh, and it's only reason, recently that we figured out what the second half is. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of the, of the first half, uh, but the second half has unfolded only within the last, uh, the last few months. It was only in August that the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights uh, issued simultaneously four decisions uh, dismissing the major anti-Semitism cases that were pending before it. Uh, in particular, two cases involving the University of California at Irvine uh, and one each at the University of California Santa Cruz uh, and the University of California at Berkeley. So the major cases uh, pending before OCR were all in California. There's one at Rikers that's still pending, but all cases were uh, 
dismissed uh, simultaneously, uh, leaving many to wonder why and what does this mean. Uh, is OCR serious about uh, dealing with anti-Semitism? Uh, is it able to deal with anti-Semitism? Is it able to fulfill the promise that some saw when OCR first issued its anti-Semitism policies? Uh, or is this really something of a sham? Um, I'll give you maybe just a little bit of a sense uh, of these, these cases, but I want to just get to some of the legal and policy matters. Uh, at Irvine, we saw over a period of many years, uh, starting in 2000 and going through at least, at least 2007, a pattern of incidents. Uh, some of it was speech, but it was speech of, uh, of, of, of saying to Jews things like uh, calling them dirty Jew, an effing Jew, and telling them to go back to Russia where you came from. Uh, in one case, it was Jews are the Jewish students are the plague of mankind. Uh, in another case, it was Jewish students should be finished off in the oven, or Jews should be finished off in the, in the ovens. Uh, there was a Holocaust memorial that was destroyed under questionable circumstances, and there were all sorts of incidents, uh, allegations involving everything from stalking to stone throwing to uh, various sorts of threats and vandalism over a period of several years and involving many students both as alleged perpetrators and as, as victims. So this was, a, this was, a, this was a, a big case. The question is, how is it that even in the most serious cases and allegations to come before OCR, OCR is the major federal civil rights agency that deals with education. It has somewhere between five and 7,000 cases each year. So for a lot of people, it's the most important civil rights agency you've never heard of. But it is the agency that is supposed to ensure non-discrimination in education. How is it that all of the cases, all of the cases, uh, were closed? Well, it seems to me that there are two big questions, two questions that OCR has had to ask. First question is, what does it mean to be a Jew? And the second question is, what does it mean to be anti-Semitic? So these are easy questions, right? These are fundamental questions. For the Jewish community, they're difficult questions. They're questions that have a great deal of scholarship and a great deal of debate behind them. And yet they're questions that have had to be answered by an agency that is not in the best place to answer them. Why do they have to ask, what does it mean to be Jewish? It's okay if I walk around a little bit. Why ask, what does it mean to be Jewish? You, can you hear me? I think so. Okay, let me know if you can't hear me. Here's the problem. Education under civil rights is different than any other area. When I first arrived at OCR, I saw that the Office for Civil Rights deals with discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, age, sex, disability, and then later, membership in patriotic youth organizations. And I thought, that's a wide variety, and isn't it too bad that they forgot to mention one of the most important ones? Religion. They didn't mention religion, so I thought you, you, you've got to fix that typo and put religion back because it's in every one of the federal civil rights statutes and the presidential executive orders all the way back uh, past uh, World War II. It was either religion or creed, and yet religion wasn't there. Now, there's a long history for why it wasn't there, but the fact is the webmaster didn't make a mistake. It was Congress that deliberately took it out of the statute that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, and national origin in federally assisted programs, including virtually every college and university and virtually every public school. So religious discrimination is not prohibited. Now, in 2002, 2003, there was a spike of anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses. So I asked Robert, well, what would we do if there was a serious allegation of harassment against a Jewish student that meets our standards of hostile environment? And the answer was, we tell them to hire a lawyer. Because we can't handle it. Because Jews are a religion. And Congress decided not to prohibit religious discrimination in education. And I thought, this is crazy. Because anyone who has done any sort of research on anti-Semitism knows that while some anti-Semitism is religious, some of it has been racial, some of it has been ethnic, some of it has had to do with a cluster of characteristics that you could call by different names, but not necessarily creed. And yet that was their position until 
2004. 2004, they made the mistake of making me the head of OCR. And I said, I said essentially the following in a case involving a Sikh boy who was, uh, who was beaten up uh, in, uh, in front of the school. I said, there are some groups that have both religious and also ethnic or ancestral characteristics. And the fact that they have a religious characteristic doesn't divest the agency of the jurisdiction that they would otherwise have. But this was a difficult question. This was a difficult question. If there's a statute that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin, but not religion, do you cover Jews or not? Well, as long as I was in office, the answer was yes. But as soon as I left, the agency stopped enforcing the statute with respect to Jews. And subsequent research shows that the uh, senior people within the agency, after I departed, disagreed with my policy and took the position that Jews are a religion. Therefore, discrimination against Jews is not discrimination on the basis of race or national origin. So we had a little debate in my first book, as Charles uh, graciously uh, mentioned, Jewish Identity and Civil Rights in America explains under what circumstances it is appropriate to say that anti-Jewish discrimination can be called discrimination on the basis of race or national origin. But that was the first question. That was the first question that OCR had to ask, what does it mean to be Jewish? And if you face discrimination as a Jew, is that discrimination on the basis of race and national origin? Well, in 2004, when I headed the agency, and then from 2010 on, OCR has taken the position for the first time that, yes, Jews are covered under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination uh, on the basis of race, color, national origin, and federally assisted programs. And yet, there are many within the agency who have been opposed to that. And so it may not be surprising that they haven't, in, they haven't actually found discrimination more than one or two cases, and certainly none that are particularly difficult or, or controversial. The first Irvine case was actually decided at a low level several years ago, half a dozen years ago. And when it was first resolved, the initial resolution, this wasn't made public at the time, the initial resolution proposed by the regional staff was to say that there was a hostile environment for Jewish students at Irvine that would be in violation of Title VI, except for the fact that Irvine has addressed it properly. Well, senior officials within the agency reversed that because they did not want to acknowledge that anti-Jewish discrimination could violate Title VI. They were still hung up on that first question of what is a Jew. And so they sent it back, and it went through a lengthy process, and there were interns and battles, and there was even litigation among the civil rights officials some accusing others of being anti-Semitic. Ultimately, the person who signed the order dismissing the first Irvine case said that he was doing it under orders, and he thought it was wrong, that the only reason that anyone ordered him to sign this is that they didn't want Jews to be covered under any grounds. This was prior to the 2010 policy. <clears throat> well, it was just a couple months ago in August that that case was decided on appeal and all the way up to the level of Deputy Assistant Secretary, now within the Obama administration, and the Obama administration now has a public record, and there's deposition testimony explaining all of this, that the people who signed this order did so under, under, under pressure, and the only reason for the order was this notion that Jews can never face discrimination, and what happened? What happened? There was a one-sentence affirmance, a one-page a one affirmance. Might as well have been said. No reasoning, no argumentation. The senior level at OCR simply affirmed the initial decision. And I would say that this was an error with respect to the first question, what is a Jew? That can only be explained, according to the regional officials who handle the matter, based on this notion that senior officials didn't think that a Jew could be covered by civil rights protection aimed at race and national art. So that was the first question. But now there are other cases that have come up, including more allegations at Irvine. And the second question has arisen. What is anti-Semitism? Because it's one thing to have a policy that says that Jews have protection against anti-Semitism. But then, what is anti-Semitism? 
and how is the agency going to deal with tough questions? Now, if anti-Semitism means that someone speaking German or with a shaved head or a white sheet comes in and burns a swastika and uses a word like hike and says something about you killed Jesus, then it's clearly anti-Semitism. But what happens if the perpetrator is a member of a different ethnic or religious minority? And what happens if instead of speaking German, they're saying slaughter the Jews, but they're saying it in Arabic? And what happens if Israel comes up in some way, as it always seems to do, when the perpetrators don't just attack a Jewish student, but attack a Jewish student in the midst of criticizing Israel? OCR is not that very difficult. In fact, many of the incidents have Israel in some fashion. Not always. As I mentioned, some of the epithets have been things like slaughter the Jews, or dirty Jew, or effing Jew, or Jews should be finished off in the ovens. And yet, to the extent that this takes place in an environment in which the perpetrators are concerned about Israel, OCR has found it difficult to make what some consider the obvious connection which is that when they are selecting Jews and hurting Jews, it may be that there's a pretext involving Israel, but it's more than just about Israel. So how do you handle it? How do you deal with it? And let me give you a couple of concrete examples that they've had in Irvine too. that is to say the more recent set of allegations uh, that Irvine um, came up at Irvine and it was just dealt with in OCR in August. And one of them, a woman who is a Jewish supporter of Israel uh, is harassed, uh, screamed and cursed at by people using the F word and calling her a slut and a whore. She believes that they think of her as being a pro-Israel activist. In another, another situation, and these are two out of about nine that are from Irvine, uh, Irvine 2, there is a student wearing a shirt that says, I love Israel. That student is harassed. The student doesn't know if she is known to be Israeli or if she's known to be Jewish, but she thinks they know that she's pro-Israel based on her activism. So here's a student who is both Jewish and Israeli and is being harassed for wearing an I love Israel t-shirt. In both cases, OCR finds that there's not enough evidence to say whether this is either anti-Semitic or even anti-Israeli, right? Because if a woman is of Israeli origin, she was born in Israel, it almost doesn't matter if it's anti-Semitic because it could be anti-Israel national origin. She is Israeli, and she's harassed for wearing a t-shirt that says, I love Israel. But if she tells OCR that she doesn't know whether they think that she's Israeli or Jewish, they'll say if there's not enough proof, uh, then it isn't, uh, it doesn't make the grade. So how do you know whether it's anti-Semitic and what has to be shown? Well, defining anti-Semitism has been a notoriously difficult challenge from the beginning, uh, in part because of the disreputable uh, etymology of the term. It was coined by anti-Semites uh, trying to uh, come up with a scientific basis for Jew hatred. It has been a difficult term to explain or to justify, and yet it's, it's, it's what we're left with. For some, anti-Semitism is defined as a hatred of Jews, or if not a hatred of Jews, a disdain for Jews, or negative feelings towards Jews. And that is almost certainly a part of what anti-Semitism means, but it doesn't get us, it doesn't really get us anywhere. So if you look at the other definitions that are common in the literature, they seem to fall into two categories. On the one hand, anti-Semitism is sometimes as a set of perceptions or ideologies, that is to say, it's a way of seeing or perceiving Jews. It's an ideology or perception. The other is to say, uh, define it in terms of conduct. What do people do? Right? It could be elements of rhetoric, or it could be ways of treating Jews. Those are the two styles. The first kind, looking at perception, uh, has a somewhat troubled history. It was adopted about a decade ago by the EUMC, the European Union Monitoring Center on Xenophobia and Racism, which is now known as the Fundamental Rights Agency. This was not their famous working definition. It was their initial definition of anti-Semitism. They defined 
anti-Semitism in terms of a cluster of categories, of, of perceptions of Jews. Whether it's stingy or materialistic or greedy, there are certain ways that Jews have been perceived over time, and that's how we define what it means to be Jewish. Uh, so, uh, if a particular person is, uh, is uh, beaten up uh, on the streets of Paris, because they are perceived as being greedy or, or, or grimy or materialistic and sort of those, those sort of attributes, that's anti-Semitism. But if the same person on the same street in Paris at the same time is beaten up because the perpetrators uh, see him as a proxy for Israel, not anti-Semitism. Well, this was a difficult definition and it got some obvious criticisms when it came out again about a decade ago. Approximately five days after it came out, there was a firebombing at an elementary school in Montreal. I try in all of my talks with Charles to bring Canada in the response. <coughs> firebombing at an elementary school in Montreal, and the perpetrator left a note saying that it was in retaliation for what Israel is doing to Palestinians. Well, this was a big embarrassment for the EUMC because it was quickly apparent that they had a definition of anti-Semitism that probably wouldn't encompass this huge uh, internationally uh, prominent incident. Slaughter of, uh, uh, attempted slaughter of young Jewish children, but not anti-Semitic. Uh, Kenneth Stern at the American Jewish Committee made an interesting uh, analogy about it at the time. He said, it's as if it's as if you were describing a lynching of an African American in the United States, and he's swinging from a tree, and you say, if it was because the murderer thought that this black man is, uh, is lazy or shiftless or is trying to pollute the white gene pool, then it's anti-black racist. But if the same man swinging from the same tree was murdered because, because the murderer didn't support the Civil Rights Act of 1964, then it's not racist. It's not anti-black. Well, this didn't make any sense at all. And so, uh, very quickly afterwards, the EUMC went to the drawing board and came up with a very different kind of definition, uh, the so-called working definition, the international working definition, or EUMC working definition. Uh, which focuses on kinds of conduct. It begins by saying that anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, but then comes up with various kinds of conduct or rhetoric which can be described as anti-Semitic, including those that relate to Israel in some fashion. The U.S. State Department has a very similar definition based on the EUMC working definition, and both of them are largely based on Natan Sharansky's so-called 3D test. Are you familiar with the 3D test? <coughs> Natan Sharansky, at the time he was, of course he's a famous refusenik, but he was at the time a member of the uh, Israeli cabinet. Uh, and he said that not every form of criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Sometimes people criticize Israel for reasons that are not anti-Semitic. But there are at least three times when you have to look at something and say it may go beyond ordinary criticism of a particular country. And they all start with a D. First is when people use double standards. If you judge Israel by standards that are different than you use from any other country, then maybe it's not just ordinary criticism. Second is demonization, which I take to mean not just strong criticism, but something that's similar to the age-old defamations of the Jewish people, where Jews were compared to the devil or to various sorts of demons. If you, if you castigate Israel, not just in strong terms, but in terms that suggest that there's some sort of sinister or otherworldly power to it. And, and if you look at it, you can see this in some of the Middle Eastern rhetoric about, rhetoric about Israel. That's demonism. And the third uh, is delegitimization. Not just criticizing the state of Israel, but arguing that it has no right to exist when all the other nations in the world do have a right to exist, but somehow the Jewish state is illegitimate. So for Sharansky, this was the 3D test. Uh, and if you look carefully at the uh, European Union uh, working definition, and at the US Department of State working definition, you'll see that, that they largely flesh out and expand upon uh, the 3Ds. Now, 
I think that for practical purposes, these are, are pretty good, pretty good tests, and they do apply to a surprisingly large number of incidents that you see on campus and uh, in, in other contexts. Um, they are not perhaps the most intellectually rigorous approach. It doesn't give you the profoundest understanding of the uh, ideology of anti-Semitism, uh, but it does give you some way of uh, separating the wheat from the chaff. But it doesn't really help you with every incident. Uh, I don't know that it's even if even if OCR were to adopt, let's say, the State Department's definition of anti-Semitism, I don't think it would be terribly radical to suggest that that the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights should adopt the same definition that the State Department just adopted within this administration. The Obama. But let's say we were to do that, and that would be that would be quite a quite a statement of seriousness about anti-Semitism. OCR did this. But what would that tell you about uh, I love Israel? There's really nothing in the State Department definition, the EUMC working definition, or the Natan Sharansky 3D test that tells you whether an attack on someone wearing an I love Israel t-shirt is anti Semitic or not. Now I believe that it's pretty likely that the person who attacks the I love Israel person has some sort of perception of, of the Jew that's related in some ways to uh, very old stereotypes about Jewish people. You'll never be able to prove that. 